Welcome to Happy Hour, the Scripts Gone Wild spinoff, where we sit down with the folks who make our reads happen, shoot the shit, and see what happens. I'm Billy Ray Bruton, and our guest this week is actor, musician, and according to his Instagram, um, a big fan of uh, Amelie. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Eric Altimus, how are you, sir? Hi, I'm so good. I'm so good. Thank you for having me. Happy New Year. Yes, Happy New Year. So you are an Amelie fan, I take it. I mean, who isn't? Honestly, like that film to me was so like impactful. It's just the music, the imagery. I was like kind of a little bit of an emo kid too. Like that movie came out in high school and I remember like, like oh, I'm so artsy. I'm watching an Amelie porn film. Yeah. I <laughs> Amelie was yeah, there were there were all of those films that I mean I I mean I'm a few, I think I'm a few years older than you uh, but there was that film in that sort of era where it was like it's Amelie not- it was uh, like Moulin Rouge Ro- yes. even Romeo and Juliet even the Baz Luhrmann stuff where they were all going for this like really uh, heightened aesthetic and I mean I don't I don't want to say I mean I don't want to say twee but I guess it was the early 2000s version of it Totally. No, it, it certainly kind of like looking back now that you say that there was like this period of time there at cinema where like the movie musical was just kind of starting to figure itself out. And Amelie is very theatrical. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but I actually have like a background in theater and that's that's what I was doing in New York City. And they actually made a production of Amelie. Yeah. Is that like ready for the stage? So I think yeah. that's probably also a little bit why yeah. I was, uh, why I gravitated towards it. But yeah, I love that film. And that song always gets me. The music is so good. Yeah. John Pearson, genius. Um, yeah, that's actually where we're gonna start because I also, uh, my background is in theater. I started and ran a theater company in Birmingham for about a decade before I moved out here. And um, so uh, I'm a big theater geek, big musical theater geek. all about it. You know your way on the boards. You know what's up. And so I'm going to, so we're going to start there because I don't get to talk theater very much uh, on these. It's usually just film and TV stuff. So I'm going to talk some theater. Um, So how did you get your start in theater? I know you are from, you're from California. Um, Orange County, is that right? Oh, God, no. I only nope. feel need to yeah d- distinguish as not where I was born and raised. I absorbed like my early life lessons in Northern California. I grew up okay, there. okay, even much better than Orange County. No offense to Orange County, it's beautiful. It's just like a little more conservative than I would you know identify myself sure. as. Sure. So um, yes, I, I grew up in Northern California, and uh, I was a young kid when I really fell in love with like movie musicals. Um, my parents were pretty influential um, as far as like exposing me to really great music. Like we would always be listening to music in my house. They had this big like record player, you know, with all the vinyls. So it was like Michael Jackson off the wall, Eric Clapton, like Beethoven symphonies mixed in with like Prince, you know? So I was absorbing all of that musicality and I don't remember the first show I saw, but I I was like six years old or something. And my mom took me to see something. And I remember thinking like, that's what I, that's what I will do. That's, that's, that's it. That's the most fabulous thing ever. Like wearing costumes and like being on a stage and, you know, being in another world. So um, I started doing that. I got like right into voice lessons as a kid. I did my first production when I was like seven years old. And it was just like little- Was it Oliver? No, that was my second one. Okay, <laughs> everybody's, my first was Oliver. Everybody's well, first was Oliver. Through, you're so right about that, Billy Ray. My first professional gig was Oliver. Like, I got paid to be an Oliver as a kid, which was dope. But my first, like, little actual, like, oh, let's do a show as kids was a production of Annie in which I played Daddy Warbucks. But the <laughs> part was that I forgot my freaking shoes the night of the show. So it was so, like, it was like a concept piece. Like, Daddy Warbucks, but no shoes. Like, he couldn't afford shoes so i just walked around in socks the whole performance <laughs> with a ball cap. so yeah that's that's what did it man like that went from there it's like, okay can't can't turn back on this now i'm, I'm too in <laughs> i'm tested i love the idea of a shoeless daddy warbucks now was this annie or annie jr i think it was annie honestly like did you straight I, up and did we the- straight up did annie it was long it was like a whole thing like i don't remember many cuts honestly my poor parents had to sit through that. God, I want to know who the hell played Rooster in that. Um, oh, probably like some guy that I had a crush on. Because wasn't Rooster always the guy that someone had a crush on? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. He was always like that guy. It's, it's that role. It's that role. <laughs> yes. Um, so 
I saw that your first, or at least what I saw your first credit when you moved to NYC was a show that I think is one of like the top three musicals ever made. And I've actually played Henry and Mortimer in mm -hmm. different productions of The Fantastics. Yeah, um, such a good so, show. Did you go into that show already loving the musical or was it one that you, cause I find like right now, like now, like the current generation of like musical theater kids have very little, I don't know if I, I don't think regard is the fair but appreciation for that musical, I think, because I, I don't know. I feel like they think it's too classical or too, I don't know, but it's, it's such a, little, a. Yeah, I think it's, well, I think it's definitely of its time. And so yeah. there's this like barrier, I guess. And like, that was like, you know, some of those tunes were, pop tunes back then yeah. trying to remember was like a pop yeah. tune like even though we would never think of it that way now it's because pop music is so different but i actually um have to admit i i, I knew of the fantastics of course and funny enough my voice teacher growing up was always trying to put that material like on me <laughs> she was like we should really sing the fantastics yeah. but for some reason as a kid i was like no i want to do joseph i want to do yeah. like yeah. flashy like 80s it's song. not as glamorous as the other music no. it's, so, and it's like, so spare exactly and and of course like you learn stuff about life and you realize how beautiful that is like yeah. the simplicity of it is actually yeah. like what is so timeless but i went into that having no clue and um it was the off-broadway production which ran for like 50 years they ended up closing it for a couple and then they moved it yeah. um so even though we were off Broadway, my dressing room was actually on Broadway, which is kind of cool. So yeah, Broadway theater right there on the corner. I think I, I saw I saw it in the late '90s there, and I'm thinking it was still in the same theater when I saw it. Probably, maybe you probably saw it. it downtown at Sullivan Street, or maybe they nope. moved it to like playwright, not playwright, something. They moved it one weird place, and then it settled. Yeah, uh, at the theater. But yeah, man, that show. I actually just was thinking about the other day, like. You know, I received this really sweet email from Tom Jones, who uh -huh. wrote the libretto and, and all the words and directed and has been in the production. And, um, you know, he's he's getting up there in age. And it was this really sweet email where basically, um, I hope I'm not oversharing, but he was like, I, since I still have it, I'm going to share like myself with you. And it was a video of him like doing a bunch of the speeches. And I'm going to save that email forever because yeah. it's it's really like when when you get to know the show, it's, it's stunning. It's beautiful. Yeah. And um, I loved seeing that music. And I got to like take on this leading role eight times a week, right out the gate. Yeah. I was working at a restaurant, I quit my job, and I was like, screw this, and I'm an actor now. And so it was it was honestly one of the best experiences, but it was hard. You know, it was a lot of learning, yeah. like taking care of my voice, not going out, resting, learning to stretch that off-Broadway salary, which let me tell you, <laughs> they don't lie when they say like, even when you get on Broadway, you're still gonna be like hustling, man, because it's NYC is expensive. So, it was great. Uh, are you are you in the group now that you've played Matt? You want to eventually play El Gallo, or are you? <laughs> I would love to play El Gallo. Actually, I think that'd be really cool. Um, and the great thing about that show and, and the company, you know, is like once you're a part of it, it really is kind of like a family. Like I haven't spoken to Tom in years, but I'll get those really kind of personal emails and if they ever do some kind of like thing with it again, or I don't know, it's just, it's such a great piece that yeah, I would definitely be curious to like circle back to it because it's about life. So I mean, yeah. there's always something new to learn or something new to hear, you know, in that in that script. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would love to do that, that would be fun. Um, you also were in another production, which I actually had the chance to see uh, which was the revival of Pippin, which is also one of my favorite musicals. Uh, it also has my favorite musical theater song of all time in it, which is uh, No Time At All. Um, uh, yeah, gosh, that's so amazing. You know, when we had, I don't know, like, I, I don't know, I think it was just a regional thing. Maybe it was, but when I was a kid and we had our, like, our theater competitions, uh, we were always going for the Irene Ryan Award. <laughs> which was named after Irene Ryan, who was Granny Clampett of the Beverly Hillbillies, who originated that role in Pippin and actually died uh, yes. backstage, I guess, or offstage during a production of it. Yes, she did. Oh my God, it's it's the wildest story, man. She actually like did her number and then like, I think Pat like died after. Yeah. Like she like got it done. And then they were like in the middle of the, like that it happened, but so crazy. Wait, what was the like award for? Was this- It was, it was an like, acting award. Through? It was an acting award that was given out in her honor. It was called the Irene Ryan Award and, and all the actors in Alabama, and I think even in the Southeast, 
that's what you were trying to get was an Irene Ryan award, which is basically just like acknowledging an exceptional, you know, performance or something like that. Yeah. And it was for it was for college. It was college, uh, you know, theater actors. Nice. And, um, but yes, yeah, yeah. she lives on. The memory of Granny Clampett lives on. I mean, let me tell you. Well, they they also put our the character that you you know that she played. Her name is Bertha in the show. Mm -hmm. And um, they we had this amazing actress who I'm sure you um, are totally all aware of. And yes. why am I <laughs> Andrea Martin? Yes. Like, like Audra McDonald. Andrea Martin. Audra would have been great in that role too. She's a little too. Um, but yeah, they, Andrea Martin was our Bertha. And I think in the spirit, you know, just who Andrea is and then with that role and that story of, uh, in the theater world is such a big story. So Andrea had this idea. She's like, I'm going to go on the trapeze and I'm going to literally fly. And I'm going to do the craziest thing. And like, I'll never forget the first day I walked in, we were called for like a group rehearsal and they'd done her number right before. And I walked in and I saw her hanging in the air and I was like, oh, oh shit. Like, what's happening it's impressive it's impressive as hell i was like this is not gonna clearly this is like a one of those ideas that they probably just spent two hours on and like i don't know we'll see if it makes it and then sure enough she got a standing ovation in the middle of that number like oh yeah it's crazy it's, it's it's very impressive like I, I i was certainly not expecting it and i yeah andrea martin's just fantastic and uh it was such a, that, produ that whole production was such a interesting sort of subversive way to approach that show you saw it in new york or you saw yeah, it yeah. like I saw it in New York. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw, I saw it not long. I guess so. Inadvertently. Like, wow, funny, cool. Yeah. No, I used yeah. to. I used to go to New York a couple times each year and just load it up on shows whenever I was. That's all I went for. Yeah. Um, I mean, we would drive from Alabama. So. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, well, ironically, I have to admit too. I actually didn't know Pippin very well before. That I knew Corner of the Sky. I knew the big songs, but again, it's like this classic show that. I yeah. think because I'd heard so much growing up, you know, I'd heard of it. And like, I heard so many guys sing Corner of the Sky. I was like, well, I've never seen that song in an audition. <laughs> and then like, I kind of just never explored the material. And again, talk about another show. Um, ironically too, similar to The Fantastics, one of Stephen Schwartz's earliest pieces mm -hmm. and Roger O'Hearson who wrote the book. So there's something about that, like maybe, I don't know, that youthful like idea of like, I'm going to, talk about life even though i haven't lived it yet that if you hit it right like those pieces are are just so beautiful yeah. so life affirming you know pippin is all about how far will you go to be extraordinary yeah. and what does that mean to you and maybe being extraordinary can be as simple as you know tending to your your family or tending to this one thing that you love as opposed to like the idea we have which gosh is so relevant now with social media and everyone being like five different things at once you know, it's like, is that really worth it? You know, yeah. um, and I love that lesson. I think it's beautiful. I think, yeah, I think that's a pretty timeless message. And I think I, I just saw that message conveyed and I'm not going to detour on this, but I, I don't know if you've seen Pixar's soul yet. I haven't, but I need to, I've heard it's and it, it is, so it, it, that theme is quite resonant in that film. And it is a, whew, it is a, gets you. Gets you. Oh, it gets you. It gets you. It gets you in the feels. Um, so would you say that when you were growing up, you were more, you, you were more, were you a big, like Andrew Lloyd Webber guy, like, or Honey, Cameron McIntosh up in the house? Anytime that my mom and I had to get in the car to drive anywhere, she got the greatest hits of Andrew, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Barbara Streisand, Bernadette Peters, basically every like female beltress, like, cause my voice hadn't changed. I would, huh? I would literally just like belt in the car, like all the, I don't know how my mom dealt with it. Honestly. Now, did you ever belt uh, take that look off your face? What? Did you ever belt take that look off your face? What is, wait, why am I blanking? It's, well, it's Andrew Lloyd Webber. It's from Song and Dance. It's from the oh, first, uh, the first yeah, part of so, Song and Dance. I was a basic kid. I knew like Phantom of the Opera. Okay. I knew like all okay. the big Andrew Lloyd Webber hits. Um, but yeah, I grew up like loving all that kind of stuff. And then I'll tell you uh, what happened. What happened was that as I grew up, I started like, you know, experiencing more stuff, like getting into other kinds of music. I like totally did a pendulum swing. And then it was like, nope, okay, just the last five years now, all Jason Robert Brown, like small yeah. music, yeah. not small music, but like small, smaller productions. And, and I, and um, yeah, I kind of stopped listening to that stuff. And then that like kind of gave way to me realizing like, oh, I really love the world of theater 
but like music is this whole other thing and it's so expansive and I've been living in this one world musically and it, it really drew me into it but I think it was going back to that thing of like as a kid I heard so many different styles of music yeah. that once I got into high school like it was like no more musical theater on my playlist I was like I'm too cool I got Billy Joel, <laughs> I got Led Zeppelin and you know like yeah cool people, Tame Impala when I moved to New York. I was like, I live in Brooklyn, and all this stuff. And then, yeah, like now it's kind of settled where like, I really appreciate it, but I, I don't listen to much musical theater anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat. I mean, I, I appreciate it when I do listen to it, but I, I don't, I, there was a, there was a large period there where that's all I listened to. It, it's just, hey, it, yeah. my records are collecting dust now. My musical theater <laughs> records are. And, sure. um, but I mean, I haven't really improved that much because all I listen to now for the last like two decades is Bruce Springsteen. So, <laughs> which is basically one big musical. So. Yes, one big American, <laughs> one big American musical. One big American musical. Um, yes. So uh, bridging bridging the gap a little bit between theater and uh, uh, sort of film television, something I saw that you did, which is fascinating to me, because I wrote actually an article years ago about this. Uh, for those who don't know at home, uh, back in 2011, uh, John Logan wrote this pilot uh, that Catherine Bigelow directed, and it had all sorts of amazing people in it, like Norman Leo Butts and Patty Lapone, and this in, an insane cast, Eddie Man. Redmayne, and and it was called The Miraculous Year. HBO was supposed to put it the series; they didn't. They dropped it before the pilot even aired. I had the chance to actually see the pilot a few years ago and was just blown away by and I was, first of all it was like how in the fuck how did you find did they, it? someone who had worked on it who was like an assistant editor who was a friend of mine had a copy of it wow. and it was like hey do you want to see this and i was like dude like are you serious and like i have no concept of why hbo didn't go to series with it i mean it's just so fantastic but they did it and so now it's just this lost thing that no one's ever gonna see i guess unless they know the assistant editor or the friend of the, or catherine bigelow um yeah. so how did you get involved in that and in, in what were your thoughts on that process well my thoughts about hbo not picking it up is my face right now yeah just the whole time i'm like shoot how do i you know and it, i'll tell you this was like one of the first kind of big real like career lessons I had because at the time I um the way it all came about was just a normal like boom you have an appointment and my agents like of course called me because they're like this is a really big project they're like you know really really work on this one <laughs> and uh, of course like I got it it was pretty mysterious but I knew Catherine Bigelow was attached I knew John was attached and I think I knew Eddie Redmayne was attached to it at that point and um yeah I just I went in I auditioned and um, I got a call back and then I got another call back, went through the whole process. I remember the night before my last call back, I had tickets to Lady Gaga, the monster ball at Madison Square Garden. And I remember being, I remember being there and like wanting to scream so loudly, but I was like, I, I just can't, I have to be able to speak tomorrow morning. So I was like, <laughs> I was like literally silent screaming during that whole concert, but um, and also like freaking out. But yeah, I, I ended up getting the role. And um, I played this little like supporting uh, lead character in the pilot who it was discussed would go on and have this whole backstory. Um, and yeah, it was it was wild, man. Shooting that was crazy. It was like the, the you know, to this day, one of the most like high profile projects I've ever worked on. And it really, like I said, the lesson to learn was just that um, don't quit your job before you have another one. <laughs> First and foremost, and also too like, even when it seems like completely 100, it's not till it happens. Yeah. Because yeah, when you look at that on paper, how like, do they pass on that? that? You're like, how, and especially now with the other shows, like it was right at the same time as Smash being yeah. developed, all these other things. And we were like this dark horse kind of show of like, it was pretty dark, like you've seen it. It's, yeah. it's, it's not a really happy uh, no. story up front. So, yeah, it, it, it was really, really exciting and really fun. But I will say, like, that was such a huge, like, lesson for me because I really thought my life was about to change. <laughs> then yeah. in one phone call, it was like, nope, they didn't pick it up. It's not happening. No one's going to ever see it. I'm like, can I even put this on my resume? Will anyone know what this is? 
So um, yeah, it was it was a it was a bittersweet experience, but I was, I've seen it as well, and it's amazing, and it's yeah. sad to me that it didn't have the chance to go on. The crazy thing about it is, I feel like it was a few years ahead of its time in the sense if that had happened now or a couple years ago and HBO had decided not to go with it, it would have gone to Netflix or it would have gone to Amazon or someone would have picked that up. No one's going to pass on John Logan, Catherine Bigelow, that insane cast. Like, it's going to find a home somewhere. Well, and I, and I think you're right. I think, like, I don't know and I can't speak on this, but I feel like like part of what happened with it was some kind of thing where HBO just owned the material. Like, their deal was that they owned it. So, yeah, they... And, and you're right. That was the first year HBO actually commissioned, like, five pilots and they only greenlit like two of them yeah and they'd never done that before and i of course so i went into it thinking oh it's not gonna be us like we literally have this incredible cast yeah and it was us. so i, you know, I think that like, was hey. that was i think that was a there was a couple year period of sort of growing pains for hbo it was between like sopranos and six feet under and then they were trying to find their footing. It was, I think, pre-Game of Thrones. And like, so they were trying to figure out what their next move was going to be. So I think they were being both ambitious and super cautious. And yeah. so that's kind of probably the ambition part's what got it greenlit and the caution's what got it axed. Right. Um, totally. I'm wondering now. So do you remember some of it? Like, I don't know if you remember. I remember, I remember very little other than I remember not being the biggest Norman Leo Butts fan. Up yeah. until that point and then I saw him in that and thought huh I'm gonna give this guy another chance and then I started diving back into his stuff like his musical stuff and everything and I was like okay okay I'm a fan yeah well it's funny I, I, I asked because we had like a little scene together and we had to like we had to, to, to kiss and yeah. seen, we'll go into it past that but Norbert was so funny filming that scene because I could tell he was just like really trying to like rev it up for me and I'm like <laughs> I was like this is already like a fantasy to me so you just tell me when to go and like I'll yeah. talk to you. <laughs> and then after we did a couple takes he pulls away and he's like oh my god I know what like my wife is talking about now with the facial hair and like the burning he's like shit that hurts <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I said, I'm a hairy dude I guess and it was just like sandpaper on his skin so he was like oh my god that's what that feels like. Was like <laughs> but yeah, no, it was a, I'm really grateful for it. And honestly, you know, that experience um, introduced me to a ton of people, people I, you know, some I still am in contact with. And um, it was, yeah, it's, it's, it's a deep cut. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, deep cuts are great. Um, What's the kind of transition moment for me when I said, Oh, um, I love theater. I always have loved theater, but this work is really exciting to me because it's so immediate, yeah. it's so fast. And part of what was so exciting was again, like the idea of getting to create this character arc that was totally unwritten. That's so, that is that is like the greatest gift you can give a creative person is the opportunity to, to create something and know that it's like, there's gonna be a set, there's gonna be a budget, there's gonna be actors. Like, what is this story going to become, you know? And and John was really open to that with all of us. He would sit down and talk to us and say, okay, let's talk about Brandon. Let's talk about this character. Let's talk about that. And of course, I was like, I have this whole plot line, honey. I was like, <laughs> he needs five seasons at least to, like, complete his arc. So <laughs> <laughs> I milked it. But, but yeah, it didn't happen. So, boo-hoo. I'm curious what to get your perspective on what it's been like from uh, – intentionally or not moving from one hot zone to another hot zone during quarantine so you started out in new york which was at the time i think the epicenter of the pandemic yeah then you moved out here which is now i mean literally the gates of hell have opened up and are swallowing la whole um For real what 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 would you say are the differences between how each city is handling it and uh what's what's it been like basically uh living in a covid tornado oh well um, I'll tell you, this is a note I wrote myself here the other day. I don't know if you can read it. It says, why did I move here? Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I know the answer to why I moved here. I am actually really, really, really grateful I did. Um, I love New York so much. And I was in the last like two years of my time there, I was going back and forth a lot between upstate New York and New York City because I just kind of got tired of hustling and paying so much for rent down there. So I up and left and I, I would just go back and forth for like auditions and stuff. Um, so I didn't see a lot of like the city's response, but I will say 
I think in general, New Yorkers just have an easier time at like group, like, like group um, think, you know what I'm saying? Like. There's something about the Wild West attitude out here, I think, that like everyone thinks that they're the shit and that they should be able to like live their truth and do it their way. And it's, and it crosses over from actually like expression to like, you have to be a part of that too. Like the other day I was hiking and some older gentleman heard me say to my mom, put your mask up. And he thought I said it to him and he, he didn't have one. And he starts like basically lecturing me about how you can't get coronavirus from the air. And I'm like, First of all, I wasn't talking to you. Second of all, you actually, that's exactly how you get fucking coronavirus, excuse yeah. my language. Third of all, like I wasn't talking to you, so shut yeah. up. But it's like, that would never happen in New York. It just wouldn't. People don't care to like prove that they're right so hard there. And that's the ironic thing. People here have that like weird idea of New Yorkers being so tough. And I'm like, no, you're just afraid because they're honest. Like, yeah. and you're misreading their toughness as just honesty, which is like, okay, we all need to wear masks, wear a mask. And yeah. if someone isn't, like, I wouldn't want to be them because I'm sure everyone would say, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Put a mask on, you know? And, yeah. and here it's such a, like, my rights, my freedoms. And, like, yeah. I really, like, have no patience for that because that's the one part of here that I'm, like, not in love with is that, like, I'm the most important thing attitude. That yeah. just doesn't exist in New York. It's, it's the part I've struggled with the most the entire time I've been here. I had an incident about a month ago. I was walking to a friend's place and, uh, and I was masked and I was about to cross the street and I, I used my elbow and I hit the walking or the crosswalk sign. And this woman next to me just goes, you don't have to do that. She's like, that's dangerous. You shouldn't do that. I was like, what? She was like, you don't have to do that. It'll go automatically. And I literally looked at her and I was like, you know, what's more dangerous? Not wearing a mask. Cause she wasn't. I'm like, you're going to lecture me. <laughs> I'm putting, using my elbow to hit a crosswalk sign like, and you're what? not even wearing a mask. <laughs> I mean, like, and what what's dangerous? Like getting like, like some kind of like bacteria on your elbow or like damaging your bone. I mean, come yeah. on. Like, and why did more importantly, why do people feel the need to start like telling you about your truth? That's yeah. That's like I don't know. Maybe I'm generalizing. I am still new to the area. And no, I'm, that's L.A. You you basically summed up L.A. in one sentence. That's L.A. I mean, and especially look, the East Side. Oh well, shoot. There are a lot of people on the East Side who are very like speaking their truth living their truth uh in terms not, not in a bad way in the sense of like living their truth in a dangerous way <laughs> that they feel uh entitled to like put on up, to. right it's that yes. thing of like i'm gonna put this on you and it's yes. like well, i didn't ask at all and no thank you i'm not interested so yeah it's very interesting i'm still trying to kind of find that balance though again like like everyone I'm mostly talking to myself, my mom and myself these days. So like, yep. you know, my friends and stuff, I'm not really meeting a lot of people out there, but yeah, that's, that's something I think that I will always love more about the East coast is just that, you know, when, when stuff gets hard and look, I think it's cause they've been through some really hard moments and yeah. we've been kind of sheltered out here and it's like, all it's going to take, not, you know, knock on wood, not to be too depressing, but it's like some big event, like that big earthquake or something to like really knock everyone here down off their like, high horse and like come together yeah. you know because that's what i think 9 11 did to new yorkers yeah and i think it's just lasted which is like okay if we got to do this we do it and we don't we don't make it harder we just do it I, it's funny i read an article today that that listed los angeles county as the most dangerous county in the united states in terms of in terms of earthquakes like fires pollution Rapid. crime all it didn't even take coronavirus into account that wasn't even part of it. It was just LA County. The the least the least dangerous county was like some county offshoot of DC. And um, oh my God, but yeah, it. it's sunny, right? But exactly, it's sunny and there are beaches and and <laughs> it's wonderful. And look, I love, I do like, I love it here. I I just do feel like I've observed that that difference so hardcore now. So I do feel like I can speak of it. It's a yeah. it's a real thing, and I just think that maybe. It'll shift here, but like sometimes it's a line in the fantastics. You have to die a little bit to grow again. And it's so <laughs> and it means that you have to go through something to realize like your growth in that yeah. through that hard thing. And I think we're going through that here, but I don't know. I think it's the wild west a little bit.
it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, it is. That attitude, you know, it's the frontier. It's away from all that establishment. But yeah, yeah. I so, still like it. I'm still happy to be here. So you're you're here now. Um, are you, do, are, you, are you doing a lot of that fun quarantine auditioning or? Oh my God. Yeah, it was nuts, man. I mean, it kind of slowed down the last couple of weeks, but literally the week in between or the week of Thanksgiving, it was like right after, I think I did like six self tapes in a week, wow. which is the most I've ever done. So it's, it's going, but um, you know, it's really competitive right now as I feel like it's even more competitive than it already was Yeah, in a way. Um, but yeah, I'm here. I, I, you know, I am very grateful. I have like a little team here that I've been working with for a long time, New York and LA. And so they, they take really good care of me and get me out there for lots of auditions. And yeah, man, I mean, you know, it's, um, I always wanted to live here because I have always wanted to really throw myself into the film thing. And what kind of sparked it was last November, I, I did this little guest spot thing, a little uh, two episode arc on Penny Dreadful for yeah. Showtime. Um, again, through my friend John Logan, was the producer and writer and creator. And that was so exciting to be out here to work on that and to like be in LA filming something. It yeah. hasn't happened for me for a long time. I did some film stuff as a kid here, but it was so exciting. I was like, oh, I want to do this. So yeah, that's kind of really the main focus of what I'm doing out here. Um, and I'm in this great acting class. So I've really just started to invest in opening myself up as an actor in film, which is, you know, a little different from the stage, sure. obviously. Um, and also stepping away from that like stage identity. I think, you know, I kind of created a, for myself a little bit in New York and it's exciting. Who knows like where it's going to go, but I'm available for a job. <laughs> I'm here. Let's figure it out together. Let's start defining what this is. Cause I'm so ready and um, yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I love, I love acting. I always love acting and then the music stuff too. I, I make music, but that's the whole thing with that is like, I'm like, look, this is my theory. Cause people are like, what are you trying to do? You're trying to do too much. I'm so confused. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, take a breath. It's just one thing and this is another thing, but this is my thought process. Like the music for me is just a way to have fun, express myself, keep myself going, yeah. create, engage and then i also think well if if i do book some kind of job that gives me exposure boom there's all this material on the side ready to go yeah because that's i'm a creative person that's just what i do i have to i have to create stuff so um yeah i'm waiting for that job <laughs> in the uh, no, but it's tough out there man yeah it's I, I i mean i've never i've i've always acted here and there i've never done it i i just could never do the like grind of actually pursuing it so it's just one of those things i've always done sort of like whenever i have time or when a friend wants to put me in a bit part in one of their films or something to to have a thick southern twang yeah. uh but i just don't have the fortitude to to do the whole like listen thing it's really hard and I, you know, talking about it right now, I try to like formulate it in a way that feels complete and like I have like a period at the end of it. I don't, um, yeah. very much in that process. It's frustrating and um, it's exciting. And I think like what my 2021 energy is just, and it's, it's really a continuation of the 2020 energy I developed, which is like, just, you know, like, I don't know what's gonna happen. All I know is like when I wake up every day, am I doing like everything I can to become a, a, a deeper person, a, a deeper actors, a more open person? Yeah. Am I willing to like deal with my life so that I can like see that more clearly? So maybe I can see myself a bit more clearly to then take on all these other characters. Because for a long time, I think what happened for me and I think, you know, speaking to that struggle yeah. is it's very easy as an actor to lose sight of who you are yeah. because everyone's telling you, be you, be you, be you, but you keep being you. And sometimes it doesn't get you what you want or you're you, you lose a hundred followers from a wacky post or you're you and you put yourself out there and someone's like, eh. So that's, I think the fortitude you're speaking to, which is really difficult and you know i deal with that in a lot of ways i <laughs> some healthier than others but mostly it's like hey, i'm drinking at 12 51 
I thought about that, but I'm 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 only doing a copy because I have scene rehearsal after this actually with my my scene partner. Though she did give me the green light if I wanted to have some wine, but it's it's a little <laughs> early. I'm actually more of a I don't want them that myself putting that because we're in California and it's legal. Yeah. And um, I just have had some like negative interactions with alcohol in my my family life and stuff. So I'm I'm yeah. a little like aware of that. But um, yeah, the other ways I deal with it is like relying on my friends creating the music stuff, which yeah, yeah, sometimes I'm like, I have no idea what this is for. I don't know, here's a visual, boom. And people are like, whoa, you just kind of put it out there. And I'm like, yeah, cause I, I have to. That's the part of me that would go crazy if I didn't have some place to put all that energy, but it's hard. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard enough writing, like just being a writer out here is hard enough. Sure. So I can't even imagine, <laughs> I mean, as hard as it is, I think being an actor is probably 10 times more difficult. I, well, I think too, to speak, like just to further, I think what's hardest is like, too, as we get older, right? We become more socially aware. It starts yeah. to feel so like me, me, me. And I'm like, not that way that that's the other part of it too. I'm like, okay, I know I got to invest in myself and I got to promote myself. I got to believe myself. Sometimes I don't feel like that. And that's yeah. in this social media world. That is also like one of the biggest challenges is yeah. like figuring out how to keep that balance going without getting too like invested in what it means to someone else because yeah. truth is no one thinks twice about like what i post no one thinks twice about what we do because we're yeah. we're all thinking that so my 21 one energy is like fuck it let it go do it do the work and we'll see you know maybe if i'm still in this boat like a year out maybe i'll go hey i'm, I'm ready for a change in my life but yeah this is the first time i've really lived here and done it so yeah <laughs> yay coronavirus <laughs> yay coronavirus hey! perfect yeah. time you know, I, I mean, obviously I don't hate LA or I probably wouldn't still be here. I certainly don't think I will stay in LA for the rest of my life by any stretch, but I mean, I certainly enjoy being here since I've been here. And, and, you know, I, I think, I, I think you, I think you'll, you'll probably grow to enjoy LA quite a bit more, e even more. So, I mean, I think, I especially think after the pandemic is over, I expect LA to be a little different. Well, you um, know, and I have to say, I mean, let's let's give LA some credit. It's absolutely stunning out right now. Oh, and, and aside course. from that too, there's there I the city is really incredible. You know, I used to come here, like I said, as a teenager to audition for stuff, yeah. and it was like driving three hours for like five second Oreo audition covered in teenage acne. So it wasn't very positive. You know, yeah. I like didn't really love going to LA. But now like I drive around, I'm like, whoa, there's cool hoods, there's live theater here, there's yeah. comedy clubs. I'd never oh, any of that stuff so i'm super excited to get into it because yeah i'm like you i'm here for a reason and i want to i want to get on that reason and then like get on <laughs> with my life. definitely check out i i I, pro I wrote and directed two shows for hollywood fringe festival out here which happens every cool. june it's a blast it's all all, all months of june they canceled this past year because of covid I was gonna say, are they? Will they just do it online? Maybe this next. Uh, year? I think they're gonna try to do a live version this year. I think they're hoping that the vaccines will be out there enough. I don't know if that's gonna happen. They sent out an email saying they were already gonna do it, but I thought that was maybe jumping the gun a little bit. Um, but it's a blast. Like you know, it's it's spread out over like ten different theaters in the middle of Hollywood. It, there's cool. some amazing stuff there. Um, I, I think. I think we'll probably do another one again there this year, but it's, yeah, it's fun. It's a great way to like dive into the live theater scene in LA and get yeah. an idea of all the different flavors that are out there. And what's great about LA too is like, it's, if you want to feel like you're somewhere else entirely, all you have to do is drive 30 minutes away. Like that's what I was just going to say. That's the thing, yeah. man, getting in my car, being able to drive someplace, like go hiking in the mountains or go yeah. drive to the beach. That, that's why I moved to upstate New York. So like, honestly, you know, like, look, nowhere's perfect. You got to take places for what they are and what they are and how lucky that I even get to think about it that way, you know, yeah. when so many others don't have those options. So like, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really yeah. actually happy I was here for this because I do feel for a lot of my friends who were like stuck in their little apartments during Corona and now it's winter. And I'll tell you, the winter was always the toughest part for me out there. Like mm -hmm. I would get seasonally depressed. It's just like no sunshine for yeah. weeks on end it chemically would put me in like a pale state <laughs> i feel like i'm the opposite in the sense of that i get i get that i get that depression from no rain oh i do too i yeah. i i've experienced a little bit out here so that's why i'm like bitch figure yourself yeah. out Let i out. need rain in my life badly and we go through such huge swaths of time where we get none but luckily we're getting into the rainy season hopefully 
Do you remember that morning when finally on Saturday morning of the election week when like finally Joe Biden it looked like he was gonna win and it started raining? I don't know yep. if it started raining where you were, but it did. Yep, where I, I remember. Was, I started, like crying. I was like, oh my god, rain! And, like, we had a great thunderstorm the other night, which was really unexpected and really wonderful, and uh, maybe actually the most thunderstorm thunderstorm I've experienced since I've been in LA. And uh, I just you know I don't want it every day. I just want it every other day. Yeah, and I'm just not in the right place for that to happen, which is kind of the problem. But uh, <laughs> hopefully one, well, you know, climate change is happening. It'll be I'm raining every day in a couple of years. The impending ice age coming, like, you know, I'm sure it's going to get a little cooler. The weather's going to get a little funkier in the next, you know, decade or so. So hang in there. You might get your wish. So I'm going to close with one final question. Okay. So think of over the, through the pantheon of theater, what is the one role that you most want to play? I've played it already, but I would like to play it again as an as a like man now because I did it when I was oh. younger. But I live, live, live for cabaret. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Favorite, I know, but it's yeah. one of my favorites because I just think it's one of the most perfect little musicals. It's yeah. like a real thing. It's like a, it's talking about something very real, and I love the historical context. I love the world, and obviously the MC. Um, I played that role in high school, and I will tell you, I still get messages today from people who are like, "I saw that production, and like, I still think of that," and and. And I remember like, it was because I loved playing that role so much. I am kind of um, at this point where I've acknowledged that like I, while I identify as a, as a, as a he, him, I am gender, like I have a lot of gender expression inside of me and I've never fully allowed it to come out. Cause like you said, we're kind of like in the same age group. It just wasn't really like condoned in our coming up, yeah. I feel. Yeah. And so I think like that role also like, allows that to come out and um it definitely have to be the revival version because i have to do i don't care much neck to like in the dress and like that moment like it's just one of my favorite little shows and i would love to play that role again so 2030 revival or something hit me up well, that was ready that was good answer um i'm gonna close with a couple of plugs uh this is going to drop when this drops our next read will be uh ma the cult classic that starred octavia spencer uh, which is going to be just a delight. Are you reading Ma? Uh, well, no, I'm reading this. I, I wish I was reading Ma. Uh, um, you know, hopefully, I hopefully we'll get. Uh, out, well, I don't want to name drop. I'll tell you afterwards. Hopefully, we've got someone awesome reading Ma, um, but who you probably know. Um, but yeah, so uh, check us out, scriptsgonewild.com, patreon.com slash scriptsgonewild. You can go on our website if you want merch, if you want shirts and mugs and all that cool shit. You can go to scriptsgonewild.com, click on the merch tab. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Eric, for popping on with us. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Absolutely. Cheers. And I'm going to drink my little. Hey. Drink. <laughs>